Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Kenny Conversation, brought to you by Jags, the leader in high-performance aftermarket car parts. Remember to go to jags.com. Well, we're honored once again, uh, quickly becoming one of the best in the world of outlaw sprint car racing, Logan Shuhart. Logan, welcome to Kenny Conversation. Thanks for having me, buddy. Thanks for thinking of me. It's great to be on. Hey, is it right now? Uh, are you 25 years old? I'm 30. 30. See, that's what got me in trouble. There's nothing wrong with being 30. But, you know, when we try to find people's ages, we look it up. And I guess what I was Googling was five years off. But that doesn't matter. You're awfully young. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of yours. And I, I think it's one of these deals is, where do we start? Do we do we start with the big win at Williams Grove on the last lap, passing Brad Sweet, the four-time World of Outlaw champion, or or do we do we talk about the million-dollar win at Eldora? I'm going to leave it up to you. Which one do you want to go with first? I don't know. Both of them were uh, pretty cool, pretty uh, memorable for sure. It took me ten years to finally win a race at Williams Grove, which is our home racetrack. So. That's always where, you know, for my family and friends that can't travel, that's where they're always coming to. And it seemed like we struggled there for so long. So to finally get a win there and in, in that kind of fashion was definitely really neat. But uh, it's hard to beat uh, that that big win uh, a week and a half ago at, in, you know, Rossburg, Ohio. So it's a uh, pretty, pretty awesome few weeks for us. Well, let's start like this. Let's start with Logan Shuhart, 30 years old, Hanover, Pennsylvania. Uh, your uh, your grandfather is the great Sprint Car Hall of Famer, Bobby Allen. Uh, the, you, know, the, you know, listen, you are very popular inside racing. I, I always tell my friends, you look, racing sometimes is a little bit of a cult. You, you can't go to Walmart, go to eat, and expect everybody to know us. However, everybody, everybody knows you inside the racing world. So before we get to these races, you you grew up in racing. Let's get it out of the way. What is it like to grow up around Bobby? What is he like? Uh, he eats, breathes, sleeps, race cars, man. He's <laughs> it. like, that's, uh, he's, he's turning 80 this year, but I don't, I don't think he slows down at all as far as his drive to want to win. And, and, you know, his days of, of racing himself, as far as being a driver, it's, has, you know, it's been a long time gone. But he's, uh, his ways of racing, even when I was, Jacob and I were kids, and it was us racing go-karts, you know, his, um, his drive to want to be, you know, what the tires were doing, how, what was the best chassis, what the guys were doing, how they were scaling the go-karts. And, you know, it was on a much different level than what he was used to. But his you know, want to, uh, you know, be the best or win and, and just race. Like he loves it, you know, down to the core. So um, I, that's who taught me to race and still does. And I've, I'm, you know, fortunate enough to have him by my side in these, these big races that we can, um, you know, race together and share these memories. And like I said, he's, you know, almost 80 years old, but I'm, you know, still travels up and down the road with us. And, you know, he's who, when I was a little kid, that's who I learned how to race from. He had a, a go-kart track here in Hanover, Pennsylvania, um, like an amusement type uh, go-kart track. Um, it's no longer around anymore. It's, it was called Speedway 94 for a little bit. But you remember and, it. Yeah, that's that's how my grandpa taught me how to, to race, really. He'd set up cones, um, you know, on the straightaways to kind of get us going high on the straightaways and, uh, you know, arc the corner and hit the apex right and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's how Jake and I learned how to race. And as we got older, it was more of why he feels the cars, you know, do certain things, what what makes them better on certain racetracks and how we can kind of learn the setups of the cars and, and, and what makes them change. So I've, um, I wouldn't say our team, you know, as a lot of people know, and like you said, in the, in the racing world, we, uh, you know, never, never really had a whole lot of money, but we had his knowledge, his, his expertise of, you know, racing experience. And I was very, I am very fortunate to have somebody like that, that can guide me to make, you know, the certain decisions that I, that we make as a team, myself and my team make. 
and uh, definitely very fortunate to have somebody like that by my side. Logan, I, I think that's wonderful because I can really relate. You know, I'm an asphalt guy and I love dirt racing. I've been running dirt for 17 of my last years, but you know, my dad was Russ Wallace, my brother Rusty and Mike, and then the great Dick Trickle would have been my Bobby Allen. Uh, you know, and it's funny how you talk about when we're kids, you know, we're born, maybe we're two, five years old, and we're learning what I call geometry, you know, high down the straightaway. How do I make that arc on entry? Where do I let off the gas? Do I drag the brake? And I really like what you're saying. I can relate. And, you know, that, that family of yours, I mean, Jacob Allen, Bobby Allen, Logan Stewart. I mean, these are the names of names. Uh, I know you are, but I just want to touch on that. How, how proud of you are, you know, with, with, with you, I call you trio. Uh, that's a pretty big deal. I'm definitely proud of how far we've come. It's that's what makes it neat, you know, to win a race at Williams Grove last weekend. Um, you know, we have some friends and family sponsors that will travel and, and go to certain parts of the country, the, the bigger events. And and we've been, you know, fortunate enough to win some of those in the past where a lot of those people have been there, but not very many are they all in one spot at one time. So, uh, and we usually have that when we go to Williams Grove. So it, it always, it was kind of a, uh, it made it tough when you go back to your home track and you, you struggle and you run 15th or whatever like that, but to have them all in one spot and, you know, they know the story, they know how we started how tough it was, you know, the, the 10, 11 years on the road and, and what it started out as to, you know, basically have no sponsors to dry dean, um, C and D rigging, everybody that's helped us out. And we have federated auto parts, um, and just how it's how it's grown and gotten bigger and bigger over the years. So those people understand that they know that, and um, that's what makes that so much more special. Well, I, I guess it's time to get to the meat and potatoes. You know, the fans that tune into Kenny Conversation, they want to know what it's like. So we're gonna we're gonna start off with uh, we're gonna have Charlie, our producer, drop that picture right here uh, that really ricocheted throughout the racing world of how shark racing started. That is your race team. Uh, who owns shark racing? Bobby Allen does. That's right. I'd rather you say it than me. Uh, so there's that picture out there when you won $1 million after winning Eldoria and we'll get in depth on that and Williams Grove, but can you tell us a little bit about this picture where it just shows when shark racing first starts, it's just a normal passenger car towing uh what is thought of is the first sprint car is, is this picture true is it accurate yeah so i think you're talking about as a subaru pulling uh that's it that's trail. it <laughs> and um so i don't believe that was actually me that was jacob and so when i first started we were running three limited sprint cars here in pennsylvania it would have been around 2009 10 11 area and that photo is probably from about 2010 um but we had one trailer, um, as a lot of people know, as the years went on, we built our own own trailer to save money. It ended up costing us about $40,000 total. Uh, but we put both cars back to back to run the World of Outlaw Tour, and Jacob still uses that trailer. Uh, no, he but, uses it still. Yeah, it's only, we did it in 2017, we, we built that trailer. And... Um, it does everything that needs to do. It might not be all the, you know, flashy cabinets and stuff inside, but it does, you know, the best job you need to run the water outlaw tour. And um, my grandpa was talking about doing another one uh, for ourselves, for our race team, but whether that happens or not, I'm not sure. But to go back to the, the Subaru on the open trailer, that would have been about 2010. And we had uh, an old Kodiak, Toter home that my grandfather used to use that he bought it back from a friend of his I believe it was Kevin Higgins and uh it was so it was like 1985 you know Kodiak uh that I'm sure those guys could share many stories of what you know, different racetracks that they took that thing to uh but it pulled a, a, sm a smaller enclosed trailer that my race car was in and when Jacob started racing um you know, we, we still just use that one trailer. So to get Jake to the racetrack, 
uh, they pulled it around with the Subaru and the, the open trailer. So definitely come a long way. Yeah. So that's what we did. We painted the picture just now. Uh, I grew up on AM, AM radio, listening to my Cardinals, you know, you had to paint a picture. And so, so we know that you got a wonderful family. We know that your story right now, this month is what we call rags to riches. Uh, I'm sure you weren't rags by any means, but let's talk about it now. So Tony Stewart decides to pay $1 million. Now this is, this is something out of fantasy land. It's not real, right? Us racers. Listen, I ate baloney and, you know, brown swagger and cheese and mayonnaise. And my brother Rusty would say, go in there and make us some sandwiches. And we all grew up with, you know, smelling like grease and, and we couldn't fathom $1 million. But my friend, Logan, look at you. You go to Eldor. Tony Stewart says, I'm going to pay $1 million. And you win. You win $1 million. Uh, we'll get to the race in a minute. But what is it like to win $1 million? Have you got the check? Tell me about all this. I was going to say, I don't, you know, people keep asking, what's it, you know, what's that like? <laughs> um I guess until the money hits your bank account or however that works, um, it's hard to say because I, I don't feel any different. <laughs> you know, it, it uh, we have the, um, you know, we know the magnitude of the race and, you know, how big it was. Um, we haven't actually got a check or anything like that yet. So um, that part hasn't hit home yet. But to just the, you know, a race that's been building up since PRI that we've, talked about you know we we thought you know there's rumors flying that you know a racetrack's going to pay a million dollars to win it wasn't really sure which racetrack for a minute and you know we all thought it was probably going to be Eldora um there's a few other ones talking about it but um Tony and his team you know I you know Tony you know he loves sprint cars he's going to want to um you know put that type of money out there for you know have a big pan you know, sprint car race. Uh, so it's something that's been building since PRI when it was announced. Um, but, you know, trying to focus on your year and, and all the other races that we have going on. We have a lot of big races this year. You know, we raced for $250,000 a few weeks ago at Houston Speedway. It's Todd Quering and his group are um, doing a lot for sprint car racing, growing the sport, the, that facility and others with Jackson. Um, but we have a lot of big races this year and it just, it just keeps growing. But that million to win is something that's kind of been in the back of everybody's head all year. And, you know, I, I knew we would have a great shot at it. It's Eldora has been good to me. I think we've won five or six races there now. Uh, and we won there in May. So I knew that we would coming back in July, we were going to have a great shot at it, but to go out and actually, actually do it and put it all together and just have the, the two days that we had to, to make it happen. It was unbelievable. So there are a lot of racetracks that you and I race at, you know, there's a scoreboard somewhere and you know, you got your stick man or you, you kind of know what's up and let's be clear. You were dominant. You had no competition. I mean, obviously your ability is unbelievable and you got to hit your marks. You were riding high. You were not afraid to die. Can he do it? Jack Hewitt. I mean, down there in turn one, you were headed to the wall, turning it every lap. I was scared for you. So tell me about those last five laps. Could you see how many laps there were left? Uh, I think the last corner, you might have gave yourself a little more room. I don't know, but I was I was watching every lap. I'm like, he, he ain't going to chance this last corner. Tell me about those last five laps. So I'd say more, I'd, I'd take you back a little bit, to probably about 15 to go. I'd say Good. The, yes. first, the first 20 laps went by really quick. And uh, so we had a break there at, at 20 laps. In. 30, 30 laps to go, we fueled the cars back up and we had some drama right there. So we had, um, you know, guys were changing gears. Um, rear ends all full of grease. Uh, bringing the jack out on the racetrack and for people that don't know Eldora it's got a lot of banking to it and uh car actually fell off the jack stand during the the um, world saw it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um but the guys did a great job they stayed very calm you know everybody stayed very calm you know pick the car back up put it on the jack stand um 
got the fuel in it and, and got back going again. But to take you back to, to 15 laps to go, I'd say more around then, you know, when you're leading a race like that, especially once you start to get to that point and knowing it has to get sort of close to the end, I was just waiting to see the white flag. Probably about 15 laps to go thinking, man, they got to throw it sometime soon. Yeah, it just and, lasts forever. <laughs> yeah, it feels like forever. But uh, right around then, I thought maybe you can glance at the scoreboard because you can see Eldora's scoreboard going down the front stretch. Uh, you can look into turn two and see the scoreboard. Um, but I sort of did that real quick, and I felt like it took my focus off what I was doing mm. and and where I needed to hit my marks. And I told myself right then, I thought, you know, maybe it's – and I actually didn't see how many laps were to go. I did, couldn't – you know, I didn't find the scoreboard as quick as I needed to. But I thought, you know, I work out every day, try to be the best in shape that I can, um, I know I have a great car. We're in a good spot. If I just put my head down, run the best laps that I can run, uh, it's going to be very hard for somebody to catch us. So um, I just tried to run that car as hard as I could, the best I could, um, and stay focused until I saw a checkered flag. And with a, I didn't see a two to go, but I did see the white flag. And I did, I had no trouble getting around the lap cars before that. I felt like it, when I got to them, they didn't really slow up my momentum at all. I was able, able to get to their rear bumper, uh, make a move on them in the next corner to where it didn't really slow down my momentum. But when I got, got the white flag, there was two lap cars in front of me, and they're both running my line, both right in front of me. And that night, the high line at Eldora was definitely the, the fastest way to go. Uh, and I didn't want to peel off and slide them or drive through the bottom of the racetrack because uh, I didn't know how close somebody was behind us. You know, we, like you said, we don't have people throwing up signs to us or, um, you know, somebody in our ear saying, hey, you have, you know, a three second lead, which we had. So I didn't know if Carson or whoever was. So, l let me ask you right there. Are, are there no are there no sticks in World of Outlaw Sprint Car Racing? Do you get no signals? No, I don't believe we're actually allowed to. Yeah, um, illegal for you guys. Okay. Yeah, it's illegal. Um, but I don't know if you could actually see them, even if you were. We're going so fast. but With the wing, it, yeah. Yeah, it's you're carrying a lot of speed. And like I said, just to even look at the scoreboard, that big, gigantic scoreboard, I felt like it was taking my, you know, taking my focus away too much. So, um, But I followed both those guys into the corner, and for people that don't know sprint car racing, when you have that big, you know, five by five wing on top of there, um, it's creating a lot of downforce. And when you get behind somebody, uh, what they call dirty air, it takes all that all that downforce off your wing. It actually almost feels like it's picking the left rear of the car up, up, mm -hmm. up off the ground. And it's make that's why when I followed the car into the corner, it actually it didn't want to turn. It was getting tight. It was trying to get into the wall. And I had to jam on the brakes and get the car to turn left, down back across the racetrack in one and two. Is that when you, you did tag the wall a little bit going into one, didn't you? Or not? I got, I got tight in the cushion, whether it was the wall. Yeah, or the okay. Cushion, definitely. It was it was a scary scenario, and it was more right. uncomfortable than what I wanted to be. But uh, I was able to drive down across the racetrack. Uh, I don't know if I passed one of the two cars uh, but I told myself going into three and four that I was taking a conservative role. I was driving across the racetrack. And if somebody, good job. <laughs> yeah, if somebody was close to me, they were going to have to drive around the outside of me, which would have been a pretty tough task in itself. So I took the, took the safe route, went through the middle of the racetrack and was able to see the checkered flag at that moment. You know, this reminds me of the Chili Bowl. You know where I'm going with this. About three years ago, Kyle Larson's, leading the race he's got to put his left front on the berm every lap there's the only that's the only grip there and he's got christopher bell breathing down his neck and uh you know i really admired kyle larson after the race because at that time it was like the only race he wanted to win you know it was almost as big as any nascar race and he admitted in his you know interview after the chili bowl that he looked up at the big screen and lost his focus going into one. So I think any young kid listening to you right now, I've been there before too, where you're, 
you try to take a little shortcut. You're like, how many to go? Oh, oh, you know, you catch yourself messing up and you're like, that's not the way to do it. And I really appreciate you telling that story because I know a lot of, you know, race car drivers are listening to you right now. So you win the million dollars. You're good at Eldora. Uh, and what is this? The month of July. And, and here you go. Now, you're not a one hit wonder. You go to quite possibly besides Knoxville and Eldora, Williams Grove. I mean, I just like saying that Williams Grove. I, I, are you, do you consider yourself Pennsylvania posse? <laughs> uh, so I like the term, I, some fans call us uh, PA outlaws. So I'm, I'm proud of where I come from. <laughs> proud of, yeah, it's, it kind of stuck somewhere in the middle there. You know, they took the, the Morgan Cup Friday. They, the outlaws took that back to North Carolina. So they claimed it. But um, I'm proud of both. I'm proud to, to, to be an outlaw. You know, I, I feel like the outlaws are the best of the best as far as sprint car racing goes. They are. And yeah, without a doubt. So, and that's where I always wanted to be. I love sprint car racing. So I, as a kid, I wanted to be racing with the best of the best, the biggest races and, and the outlaws are where that's at. So, uh, but to, to grow up in a, you know, an area of sprint car racing in central Pennsylvania that you have Williams Grove and, and Lincoln Speedway and uh, Port Royal and all the work that they've done to make that is as good as it is. You know, I'm just, you know, I, I just think that's awesome. The, the passion that the PA fans have and to grow up in this area and to learn how to drive a sprint car uh, with, you know, greats like Greg Hodnett and Lance DeWeese and, um, you know, who, those big name guys that were around here that, that form, you know, sprint car racing. And Fred Raymer, when I first started, you know, one of my first races, he, he beat the Outlaws and Stevie Smith, you know, all those guys that, and, and that's one reason I'm, you know, I kind of like being, you know, in the middle as far as that goes. You know, Stevie Smith with Smith Titanium is, is one of our, you know, he has a lot to do with shark racing and all his components. Uh, does a legendary lot. Legendary name. Legendary. Le legend. But as a kid, you know, he was from New Oxford. It's right up the road from where I live. And he raced with the Outlaws for a long time. And he was always one of my favorites. So as a, as a kid, you know, and now as a race car driver, I always thought that'd be cool if, you know, kids looked at me the same way, you know, as the PA hometown outlaw. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of that. So you, you win Eldora, you win a million dollars. You basically go home to Williams Grove. You're running second to Brad Sweet. I feel like you and Brad have been glued to each other here lately. Uh, you really, you, you've really, I've followed everything. You know, you run one, two at the million dollar race, uh, then here you are, uh, this is last week, Brad's leading the race at Williams Grove. Your guys, you're coming to the checker and you get by him to win in front of your people. I mean, it's almost bigger than a million dollars because your, your whole life, my whole life, I mean, like, hell, if I just win with my grandkids there, it's like bigger than big. So take me through the last half lap or last lap at Williams Grove and then getting out of the car and there the family is. Tell me about this huge win at Williams Grove with the World of Outlaws. So it's kind of wild is Brad and I both uh, in the past, I'd say five years, we've uh, we've both struggled at Williams Grove for whatever reason. You know, <laughs> that seemed to be one track that, you know, say we were running well in points and, and wanted to be consistent. Obviously, you have to. Uh, but that was one that I feel like, you know, Brad would go there. He'd kind of struggle. Our team would struggle. Uh, now, the past few times that we've been there, we've both been been running up front. So, um, I feel like we both kind of figured something out, got our cars where they need to be. We're both qualifying well, starting up front. Um, but I was happy with running – I mean, you're never happy with running second. I was, it's okay. I, I totally get it. I yeah. get it. At that at that point, <laughs> I felt like, you know, we're going to run second. Second's it's, good. It's, it's a good run. Um, you know, like I said, the place has been tough to me. You know, if we could just hang on, get a podium finish, um, you know, we'll try again tomorrow. Um, but I followed Brad the whole race. We ran the top of the racetrack. 
and we got to some lap cars. They held me up a little bit longer than, than what I would have liked. I didn't get by them as quick as I needed to. And I'd say I look, I did look up at the scoreboard at that point. Um, it's a little easier at Williams Grove to do. And I saw, you know, that track, like the back of your hand. Yeah. There's 20 laps in it's only a 25 lap race. So at that point I thought, well, I'm just going to pull the wing back and try to move around the racetrack and see if I can find something. Cause you know, what where am is I that? Where is that wing adjustment in your car, Logan? Where, wh what hand do you use? How do you do that? Uh, it's, it's right to the, the left of the steering wheel. Um, Right underneath the steering wheel, you have your on and off fuel switch, um, fuel lever, and then to the to the left of the steering wheel is your hydraulic wing cylinder. So, um, I can, it's easy, you know, to just grab that quick yank on it, and especially um, going backward, it'll go back a lot quicker than what it goes forward. So, if you're going down a big long straighter like Williams Grove, it's got all that pressure on it. You yank it quick, and that that wing will go back. So, um, that's interesting. You can, it, it, I basically pull it the whole way back, tried to see if I could find somewhere else on the racetrack. And um, Brad, you know, I was, what they say, two, two seconds behind him the last two laps or something like that. And when we went into one and two for the final time, I think he still had a second and a half. Um, but I think he got up in the cushion, got up the higher side of the racetrack and whether, um, you know, something was going wrong with his car at that point. Uh, but he seemed like he really sat still and I felt we gained, you know, six, seven, eight car lengths and you and did this one, <laughs> one and two. So, um, really called up to him. And then I was almost on his bumper going down the back stretch. And when we went to go into turn three, just a few weeks ago at, at Cedar Lake Speedway in Wisconsin, uh, we had the same similar scenario. I was on his bumper. He kind of blocked me going into three and four, ran the bottom you know, the perfect move that you need to do as, as a leader. And I tried to run around the outside just like we did on Friday, uh, but we came up short, finished second to Brad, and uh, he got the win. But um, at Williams Grove, you know, he went to the bottom enter in three, and I knew that he was, he was going to do that just because of weeks prior. And I ran the top of the racetrack this time. And when, when we came out of four, He's, you know, it's probably the same problem that he had coming out of two. His car just really sat still, and I could see his tires spinning. Uh, you know, dust is flying off the rear of the car, and I just got a huge run off of four. I felt like I was 10 mile an hour faster than him at that point, and just tried to stay a little higher on the racetrack, and I knew when he came up the corner, he was going to take it to the outside wall, and I just waited until I got almost to his bumper, to kind of turn the car left and try to just get underneath of him. And when we got to the line, it felt like we were pretty, you know, equal whether, you know, you never know where the transponder loop is either. It can be, you know, right before the flag stand at the flag stand past the flag stand. Um, and I knew if, if it was before the flag stand, he probably won. Um, mm. But if it was at the flag stand or just past it, then we did. So it wasn't until what I a race. came around turn two looked at the scoreboard and saw the one on the board that, that I knew we won. So I was pretty excited at that point, just because it's took, taken so long to win at that place. Um, the PA fans were awesome, cheering, yelling. Um, They're boy. Really making us feel good. I felt like we won the million all over again, really. Um, it was a 15,000 to win race, but man, it just, it felt good to, to finally win one at home in front of all your, all those fans. Uh, friends and family that I knew were there. And let, me, let me interrupt you one minute. I, I heard something, you know, I listened intently. Uh, you said you learned something at Cedar Lake, and I think that's interesting. You know, you you followed Brad at Cedar Lake. You kind of knew his tendencies. Cedar Lake, uh, I have it wrote down here, 2016. Was, was Cedar Lake your very first World of Outlaw win? Very first win in 2016. Wow. We haven't we haven't won there since then, but that was our very first win uh, in 2016. So now you fast forward and you you think about that because you know his tendencies. Man, I'll tell you what, this is there should be a short story, a, a movie made of this this last month with you, Eldora. You learn a lot at Cedar Lake because you he Brad reminds you of his tendencies. You remember that going into the turn three at Williams Grove. Okay, so now you win the race. Okay, I just wanted to talk about Cedar Lake for a minute. So now you win the race. Okay, take me through victory lane. 
Uh, well, I'd say when we pull across the scales after, you know, you pull off the racetrack in turn two, um, you got to scale outside the racetrack. So our teams are over there, you know, they're hooting, hollering, fist pumping, clapping. <laughs> um, and there's a cool, uh, so I think we actually posted to our social media. Uh, there's a GoPro right, right by my head. You can see my excitement. Uh, but you can, as we pull back out on the racetrack to go around, um, you know, you have the infield fans, Beer Hills up here on the right. Um, they're all cheering. Um, so just really cool feeling. And when we get to victory lane, man, and for, for sprint car fans or people that don't know sprint cars, our, our biggest race at Williams Grove comes in end of September, beginning of October. It's Williams Grove National Open. And, you know, this being a 15,000 win race, um, Williams, the National Open 75. But anyways, pulling around turn four to, to victory lane on the front stretch, there was probably a couple hundred people on the front stretch for us to pull in the victory lane. And I felt like we just won the national open or something. So it's, uh, you know, like I said, a couple hundred people standing there, you get the victory lane, they're, they're shooting the confetti, um, you know, friends, family, um, I can't give hugs fast enough, you know, um, you know, I'm getting punched in the arm by some some family members, hugged by other ones. I'm be, I'm I'm emotional for you right now because I I feel it. I feel yeah. it. Yeah, it was. Uh, but just the 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 then to get on top of the wing and um, you know look at the crowd and see how happy they are. <laughs> is, yeah, definitely a really cool feeling. You're getting I, practice on that wing here lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got a few chances to get up there, that's for sure. And it's, you know, you got to take them when you can get them because this racing thing, it's it's tough. We've been, oh, yeah. um, you know, my teammates down a little bit right now, but I can see, you know, I've been in that position. I know what it feels like to just get your butt kicked all the time. And even last year, you know, we won one race up until um, a couple weeks from now. And it's it's tough. You know, you're racing with the best of the best. Like you said, Brad is a four time World of Outlaw champion, uh, wins, you know, sometimes double digit races in one year. You know, him, David, Carson, uh, they're so good on a, on a weekly basis at every racetrack. So when you can put your car in victory lane and you're able to win races like that, it, it definitely is um, almost feels like a big weight off your shoulders that you can get that done. Um, but they're definitely the best of the best. And, you know, I have a high level of respect for all of them for what they do. I think that's a good attitude. We talked to Donnie Schatz last week on Kenny Conversation. And uh, here we all know that, you know, as of right now, Steve Kinzer is the greatest with the World of Outlaws and probably Donnie Schatz. And, and Donnie is devastated right now. Even though he, he won a big race at Eldora this year, he feels like he's not where he needs to be. I mean, th this is the life we live as dirt racers. We're, we're dealing with different track surfaces every night and this and that. It 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 is feast or famine, don't you think? It is. That's how, I, you know, Donnie, like you said, he just won the Kings Royal. But when I first, you know, my first couple of years racing with the World of Outlaws, Donnie was winning 30, 35, 30. <laughs> So I, I guess when you have you he's know, devastated right now. Yeah. When you're when you're used to doing that or when you're you know what that feels like, yeah, your expectations are high. And I've I've been around long enough to, you know, you know, just with the small amount of success that we've had that the expectations don't come back down. Every year they get higher and higher and higher and you're expected to do more. Everybody around you expects to do better. It doesn't always work like that though. It's it's part of racing. Uh but yeah, Donnie is definitely he's awesome. Like the, as far as the my respect for a driver like that, that as good as he is and how smart he is on the racetrack and clean at the same time, um, definitely you know one of the best race car drivers I've raced with, no doubt. Uh, I do also have a very high respect for the crew chiefs in in our sport. Uh, for for Jacob and I that have more of a hands-on role than I'd say some other drivers do but it's uh you know the guys like Philip Dietz on the 41 car you know Ricky Warner on Rico's car um you know Cody Jacobs with David Gravel they're very smart 
as far as knowing what the racetracks call for, you know, the drivers get the, you know, the fun job. They get to get in and drive the things. And if it, you know, sometimes it makes them, you know, look really good. Sometimes it can make them look bad. But. As Kenny Schrader says, Schrader says, listen, Arm, we're all pretty good. You know, and as my brother Rusty says, get your head in the carburetor. And as Dale Earnhardt taught me, you know, a slow horse does not win races. So I like it that you're giving a shout out to the crew chiefs. You know, what makes the car fast? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'll know within a few laps. We make some changes that, you know, we're unsure of. Sometimes it works out great. You know, we'll make some changes that we're unsure of. And, you know, I run the first three laps. I mean, man, you know, I have a great shot at this. You know, Your we're... eyeballs are like, damn, this is yeah. me. <laughs> I can drive. But it can also have the opposite effect where you run one or two laps and you're like, man, this is going to be a long race. I'm gonna <laughs> gonna take everything I have just to stay where I'm at, just to get a top ten, or you know, say we're starting tenth or eleventh, just to. And which we had the same, you know, that that happened on Saturday. We started ninth and finished eleventh, and it, it takes a, a few laps to to be like, you know, I'm gonna have to race this thing hard just to stay where I'm at. So, um, but I do I have a high level of respect for those crew chiefs that they can, you know, mine's a little bit different. I can. I go run a couple laps in a heat race and I can say, well, it kind of felt like this. What do you guys think? And make, you know, changes accordingly. Uh, those guys, you know, they sit in the infield and watch their car go around the racetrack and come back and make those changes. Or, you know, maybe they're just very good with physics or, or whatever, but they um, no high level respect for, for how, what they do. I want, I got a couple a couple more things, uh, but I want to touch on this. I, I, I see how the sport has changed. Uh, myself, I'm going to be 60 years old, August 23rd. And, uh, you know, listen, I've watched my dad, my grandma, my grandpa, you know, all have, uh, you know, cardiovascular problems. They've died. And, and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to eat salmon and chicken. And I'm going to, you know, I, I would do all my own work. Logan on my race car, and I'm in good shape. Here's where I'm going with this. When I talked to Donnie Schatz last week, and when I talked to Brad Sweet before Donnie, both of them brought up what you said. You said you work out. Uh, Donnie said that his neck is so strong. Uh, I'm hearing more and more of you World of Outlaw racers talking about working out, how strong you are. Uh, you hear the Formula One guys that race in a different country every other week. This is the new world we live in. I mean, you're, you're, you say you're working out. I mean, you focus level. Tell me about everybody working out with, you know, to be the best they can be. Yeah, my teammate, both of us, Jacob and I both, we both try to, you know, we'll go on runs together. Uh, we might go to the gym or, or do whatever. I know Brad works out. I've seen him at my local YMCA when we're in town and run into him there. Um, you know, I remember seeing Donnie, you know, he, he works out all the time. He used to be a little bit bigger and lost some weight. And I know he said he felt, feels way better in a race car. Donnie says he's got the strongest neck in all of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Probably does. Yeah. Hey, I think when he started working out is when he started winning those, those 30 races a year. He, so he was um, – but no, I think all, you know, all over in general, I think it makes me feel better in a race car. You know, when I first started, there were some races uh, where I felt like I was getting tired and not totally tired where you can't even hang on to the car. But your the problem is your focus is, you know, why am I breathing heavy? You know, I'm, uh, my arms are kind of worn out and you're thinking about how you're tired instead of being focused on the racetrack and how you're going to you know, attack the car in front of you, you know, hitting your marks and that's where your focus should be. So, um, it, you know, all in all, I, I think working out is just good to, to keep you sharp up here. Just, uh, just, you know, just to keep you in shape and, you know, keep you mentally sharp. Um, you know, from your day to day tasks, you wake up in the morning, you go for a run and you work out, um, you know, you already completed one of your tasks for the day. And it's just, you know, going through the motions. My dad was a Marine. Um, mm. He's, he taught me at a young age, you know, when I 
didn't pick up my room or something. It was 20 push-ups or whatever. That makes sense. So, you look structured. You're stout. <laughs> oh, thanks. But yeah, that's, so I think part of that I got from, from him. Um, and we'll still work out in the wintertime. He's, he's um, in his later fifties, but we'll, uh, we'll work out together, go to the local YMCA or actually today uh, I went for a run and he rode his bicycle next to me. So um, yeah, I definitely got that from him. I think it's, there's no disadvantage to racing uh, as far as, uh, you know, being in shape. It's, it's not going to hurt you. I can tell you for any young kid, um, you know, it's, it's definitely not going to hurt you. There's no disadvantages to it. So um, as for myself, I feel like when I first started, it's any, any advantage that you can get, like I said, these are the best drivers, the best teams in the country, in the world, really. And if you have any type of advantage that you have at your exposure, you should take it. So uh, as far as working out and being in shape, uh, that's just, you know, one of those advantages. Logan, I, I love talking to you. We're already at 42 minutes. So let's, let's end it like this, my friend. This is just going to be fun for me. I, I hear both things from you. I know a million dollars is life-changing in, in some ways. But also, you know, listen to you about, you know, Williams Grove, the win at Williams Grove. So let's end like this. We, we got a million dollars at Eldora, where you've already won a lot, but this one paid a million. And, and, and you finally won Williams Grove in front of your family. It, you know what I'm saying? It, it almost sounds to me like you're more excited about Williams Grove. And, you know, we both grew up as children, right? Racers. Just, just break. Let's end the show like this. Break both weekends down for me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I actually got asked that by a fan uh, this past weekend. I didn't know how to answer it because uh, they said, there's a PA fan, obviously, we're at Williams Grove still, uh, but they said, hey, if you put money aside and money wasn't part of it, which one was, which one meant more to you? And I thought, man, that's tough. Like, I feel like I know what I want to answer, but, uh, you know, the million just so life-changing. Like, I, I've told people in the past, you know, I just want to race for a living. I just want to be a professional race car driver, uh, be able to do what I love to do. And if money comes along with it and I'm able to, you know, be successful enough that I can race my whole career and, and you know, do all the things that we got to do is, you know, as far as people to take care, care of our family or whatever, you know, that's what I want. But definitely, you know, winning a million dollars, that's life changing for myself as a, as a sprint car driver to, um, you know, be able to put that away or, or do whatever with it. Uh, like I said, we're trying to build a, a, a shop house. So that's, you know, that's where probably a lot of that's going. People have asked me that, but. So um, do you, let me get nosy. Do you, do you make 50% too, or are you a little less because you're family? <laughs> when I win, I get 50%. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Thank you. <laughs> So yeah, when you when you win, it gets uh, yeah. five hundred thousand dollars, baby. Buy buy a garage. <laughs> uh, trying to build a shop house not too far from ours right now. So, uh, but the win at Williams Grove to to win on the last lap with you know it wasn't a, a, a nobody either. Like you said, Brad Sweet is you know up there with the best of the best. Uh, so to beat somebody like him at our home track. Uh, with all our friends and family there, man, that was definitely a very memorable one. Um, but I, I hate to put one above the other. Yeah, well, well, Logan, my eyes are watering a little bit for you because I, I, uh, I just relate with you. I really have enjoyed talking to you. Congratulations! Now, listen, we all know, we all know the peaks and valleys. We get all that, but you know, it's it's like the races that I've won on asphalt my crew member goes over and checks the right rear tire. I'm like, we'll worry about that tire later. Right now, we just want a big race. So take it easy on yourself. I know I know it's a long world of outlaw season. I know you're going to win. You're going to lose. But, buddy, um, you got it going on right now. You're, you're, the, you're the biggest story in the world of outlaws. And uh, congratulations. Thank you, Kenny. Thanks for thinking of me, having me on your show. It's great to, great to talk to you. We have to share a, a story, uh, you know, kind of you're you're a little bit rags or riches financially. You, you did not let money, you know, stunt your growth. Now you got a million and 
<laughs> now you'd be able to pack some wheel bearings and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, listen, that's the legendary already at 30 years old. Uh, Logan Shuart won a million dollars and then backed it up with a huge win at Williams Grove. So remember, we are on uh, iTunes, Spotify. We're in podcast form. So remember, please like and subscribe. We want to hear what you think about Logan's big wins lately. And uh, Logan, thank you, buddy. Thanks, Kenny. Appreciate it. Thanks again. See you later, everyone.